All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to Emma Void's Let's Play of Escape. Uh, last we left off, the navigator had managed to find Text Kid, although didn't deign to tell us yet what happened afterwards, so thanks. And then, well, no, prior to that, uh, we also got to see some more stuff going down in the muck. It's... I'm, so, they're definitely connected, right? I mean, they have to be. The muck is definitely the text the text kid was looking at. But who is text kid? I mean, at a guess we might say Rain, but then I was kind of thinking that Rain might actually be an AI with how she was replying to all that stuff. So, I don't know. Well, let's find out, shall we? Chest thumps like a drum. Nothing lasts as long as the beat. Nothing sounds as deep as the pound. Nothing. Nothing. Dancers on the desktop, twirling to a tantalizing sound. Magnetic beats, magnetic feet, pulling in, pushing out. Dancing. Dancing. Horned on the wall, shaking with a syncopated pound. Not a buzz about it anymore. Not a grip about it anymore. Falling after all. After all. I see. Yeah, those... Those mind that chunks sort of seem like... I don't know, creative writing class, basically. <laughs> A vast field stretches across myriad hills and valleys, dotted by humble stone houses and farms. To the west, the edge of the woods looms, while to the east, the jagged peaks of mountains span the horizon, Connecting many of the commonly visited locales are thin dirt roads that can't seem to keep the grass away. Uh, available exits, other travelers nearby. Jace stretches his limbs. Boy, am I glad to get out of that stuffy forest. Osmandius huffs. That stuffy forest is my home, I'll have you remember. We smirk. Hasn't always been, though. We must really love the place to get so defensive. Cosmandius is typing. Osmandius shrugs. One's home is where one rests their head after a long day's work. That cottage just happens to be the place I frequent in most as of late. We dash ahead, doing our best to avoid stepping on the patches of grass that poke up through the road. So, what? If we got captured by, say, bandits, and we slept for a week in their camp as prisoners, you'd start calling that home? <laughs> Rain's a bit of a smart aleck, but I appreciate it. Osmanius groans. Dear, I think you're missing the point. Chase perks his ears. Dear, eh? Let me see. He calls everyone dear. Jay, seriously, we were just talking about this. Come on. Chase pouts. He doesn't call me dear. <laughs> awesome, and he elucidates. You are not female. You laugh. I'm digging the music in this so far. It's all, it all does a really good job of um, sort of setting the tone of each scene. Osmandius continues a steady pace along the path. What I mean to say is that we grow attached to our surroundings given enough time. I suppose, yes, if the hypothetical bandits captured us, forced us not only into captivity but to share their accommodations, one may eventually grow accustomed to them and become attached to the locale. But I believe it would take far longer than a week for a home-like feeling to kick in, and even still, that would be some sort of dementia or another psychological disorder. Chase raises a brow. Say what? Osmanius elucidates. In layman's terms, you'd be straight up nuts. You spin the face-offs. 
What if, say, Jason and me are actually these hypothetical bandits? This whole world is our camp, and your cottage is actually the accommodations we've set up for you to feel as much at home as possible. <laughs> I'm enjoying seeing Osmandius's whole holier than thou shtick getting turned around on him. Osmandius laughs. Then I would suppose I'm either further gone than I had initially thought, or you're the most kind spirited captors I've encountered. Chase paces, picking up a few stones. You've been held captive before then. Ah. Osmandius frowns, looking to the tall grasses as they pass by. Of course. Live as long as I have, and you're bound to make enemies. Make enough enemies, and one of them is bound to hold you prisoner for one reason or another. I'd rather not mention the details, but to answer your question, yes. In fact, I'm surprised they haven't tracked me to this world as of yet. So you're on the run? Osmandius shrugs. Technically, I might be dead were it not for the luck of the card that sent me here. Uai Oz, your luck seems to be pretty good. You ever get a foul draw out of that thing? Because if not, I'm calling bullshit. Chase smirks and spins a little orb of water on his fingertip as they walk. Bet that's how he got into that whole mess to begin with. Osmanius says nothing. Chase says, that's it, isn't it? A bad draw. He turned back around and jogged to catch up. So, why do you keep using them? Hmm. Osmandius remains silent for a time, then speaks up. It's all I know. There's, it's like you've said. I'm a captive of the fates. I do what they will of me. The only control I have is when to invoke their intervention. You cough. Can I intervene for a sec? I scan the field with a vacant look. How exactly is wandering about outside the forest helping us track down where Barry and Yon disappeared to? says, hey, you're the one that wanted to get out of that place. <laughs> I mean, true, but... Osmanius elucidates, the reason is quite obvious. Chase says, cards? Barry arrives from the west. Cards? Osman- <laughs> Barry says cards. Wait, Barry? <laughs> Let's see. What's going on, guys? Okay, Barry, are you gonna poof again? Cuz, seriously. Jace spins, Barry, where on Verda did you come from? Or, well, where did you go? Osmanius smiles, young miss, I'm glad you're safe. Barry, I'm fine, can we just pretend I fell asleep or something? He says, we were so worried. Still so worried. Jace coughs. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Barry uggs and staggers a bit. Barry says, the things got the things got yawn, I barely made it out. You frown and take a hand to Barry's forehead. You look terrible. 
we should get you a bed and soon. Ozymandias rubs his chin. Where is Yon? Is he back in the forest where you were taken? Marion, I wasn't in the forest. We appeared in the farmhouse. Huh. Barry mumbles and points to the farmhouse. Barry says he's in a coma. A coma. <laughs> I appreciate that Barry has such terrible spelling ability. Chase extends a hand. Come on then, you can show us where Jan is. Barry takes Chase's hands. Thanks. This way. Barry heads to the farmhouse. Chase. And us. A peaceful summer. A peaceful farmhouse with a sofa, kitchen, and a few bends. The able exits out. Other travelers, Barry, Chase, Yawn, and Stone. Hmm. <laughs> that was an envious. Barry points. See, he's in a coma. A coma. <laughs> I also appreciate that no one's given her shit for it, though. Jace rushes over to the bed Yon is lying upon, resting a palm on his shoulder. He lifts a wrist to check the pulse. Sure enough, she's right. He's alive, but only barely. Barry, ugh, so why would I lie? <laughs> you see, sorry, Barry. We're all trying to catch up. Osmandia seems to be lost in thought, fingers idly tapping the deck of cards at his side. Jace crouches down, letting a trickle of water flow into his palm and spread out. He presses it against Jan's forehead. You look at Oz. You're not thinking about using those things, are you? It's one thing to whisper a little m message in my ear, something else entirely to focus on a comatose kid. Osmanius begins to shuffle the deck. I have to do something. What else can we do? Have you ever heard of wishing someone back from a coma? Jace looks back at Oz with a glare. Are you listening to yourself? This isn't just some normal, oh look, he's unconscious thing. He disappeared before our eyes, along with Barry, and then they reappear and he's out of it. Obviously something happened to him. If we find the mock, the mock beast, we might be able to find some way to reverse it. Osmandius does not flinch. And where would you propose we do that? Whatever these beasts are, they have some way of phasing between worlds. Suppose they don't wish to be found. Would it be possible for us to track them down? Barry says out of character. Wow, you guys are on a roll. Um, well, m maybe we look here. We appeared here, right? I smile. See, all you boys needed was a little common sense. Chase, you're with me. We're searching the second floor for any sign of these beasts. Barry, you stay here and keep an eye on Yon. Say, and make sure Oz doesn't do anything reckless. <laughs> Barry nods. You betcha. Jace nods as well, taking a cautious hand to the railing as he begins his ascent. Hop up the stairs after Jace. Ozymandias frowns, continuing to idly shuffle the deck of cards while watching the two head up into the dimly lit second floor. He twitches, fighting the instinct to draw one more card. Barry moves to yawn, wraps her arm around him. Hang in there, baby. Says, hey, stop shuffling. They said nothing reckless. <laughs> I 
Osmanius looks down, realizing just now what he had been doing. Apologies, he says, patting the deck and placing it into his bag. Jace looks back at Rain. You take the left bedroom, I'll take the right. He frowns. Seriously? There's only two of us, and you plan your plan is to split up? Nope. We're both taking the left. Within the bag, the cards begin to grow warm. They tremble like an itch waiting to be scratched. Hmm. So I'm guessing that's stone again. Osmandius tries to ignore the sensation. He takes a seat in a chair facing Barry and the unconscious body of Jan. I'm sorry all of this had to happen to you, he says in an evenly metered voice, despite his growing unease. Perry smiles. It's okay. She says, I know he's going to be okay. Chase takes a deep breath, raising his arm to the closed wooden door. You ready? he asks. Of course. That's why I'm here. He says, well, yeah, but, you know, I just wanted to check before. Just shut up and open the door already. The cards burn. Perry says, we haven't been together long, but I trust him. Osmanius nods, a bead of sweat trickling down his temple. Perry says, He saved me when I almost died, so he can't die, I know it. And they burn. Oz, buddy, you might want to get that checked. Osmanius grits his teeth. Jace grasps the handle tight, turning it with the smallest of gestures until he hears it click. Oz reaches for the cards. <laughs> oh, this is not going to end well. Ozymandias grunts, yanking his arm away forcefully. Huh? Oz, what are you doing? Oz bats his own arm away, making another grasp for the slim pieces of waxed paper, ever so close. Jace slowly pushes in on the door. Osmanius makes a hurried attempt to wrestle his bag away from his body, anything to get those damned things away from him. Oz swings a powerful fist toward his own gut, winding himself. He thrusts his hand into the bag's pocket. He groaned. Hurry it up there, Slowpoke. You shove a shoulder into the door from behind Chase. Chase yelps, tumbling headfirst into the darkened room, with Rain just behind. Barry runs into Oz. No, stop it! Nothing stupid, okay? Ozymandias violently deflects Barry's assault out of pure instinct, eyes wide as he realizes what he's done. He staggers back, mouth agape, as one last breath reveals that he is... Dropped the cards upon the ground, they flutter to the hardwood floor like autumn leaves, and as Oz surveys the dim room, he sees that one card is not like the rest, the one that lies face up on Barry's collapsed body, glaring back at him with burning embers. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Osmanius elucidates, and scene. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, sounds about right.
Navigator's Log, 5th of June, 20XX. Luscious literates, in case you're curious, I do have some remorse for leaving you hanging yesterday. Literally, as soon as I hit send, I felt a huge knot well up in my stomach. I honestly don't know what came over me, but like, I thought I should let you know. It did, however, get me thinking about the concepts of curiosity and agency. Specifically, how the two work together. I'm not proud of it, but literally since beginning these logs, I have been appealing to your curiosity with wild, brash statements. Doing so, I maintain a solid grip on your goal-oriented decisions. You may hate me for my brash nature, but ultimately I hold your curiosity. Why? It's nothing so different from some scam company's claims that a weird little trick is really going to get rid of male pattern baldness, save you money on car insurance, or make you $500 an hour from the comfort of your own home. You're being hypnotized. Not a believer? Don't think it's possible. What if I told you that you're hypnotized right now? Reading, watching a video, getting engrossed in any sort of act that dem demands your concentration are all forms of hypnotism. It's a hyper-attentive state where everything you perceive with your mind is so real. It's how we get lost in stories, allow things as simple as words to come to life in ways only our minds are capable of rendering. Think about what frames do. They empower your mind to encrypt your communications as dream imagery. But it also does the opposite. It accepts that imagery, that pure mind that, and decrypts it back into rational information. Why is it able to do this? Because every moment we use our frames, we're open to suggestion. We're being hypnotized day in, day out, because that's the only way to interact with the Serenat. Adults in a hypnotized state are, in fact, a lot like children, much as they loathe to admit it. Capable of grand adventures without leaving the comfort of their own homes, able to imagine themselves in entirely different lives than the ones they, than the ones they truly live. It's a wonderful form of escapism, and it's a shame to have that broken. Just how legitimate is anything you receive via mind that? Are the messages you send being received as you sense them? I'm sure your subconscious will keep that doubt coming back for quite some time now, with or without you. But that's enough introspective bullshit. Let's get back to business, shall we? There are certain things you expect to see in a corporate office. Elevators, cubicles, water coolers, ominous corner office with offices with impressive titles on the door like Senior Management Director of Junior Management Coordination. Ugh, that sounds awful. That one guy with the unfortunate mustache who always asks what's going on next weekend and gets ignored because fuck that guy. What you don't expect, ever, is a jungle room. I'm not shitting you. There is literally a door that says jungle room on it. I mean, I didn't physically go in there, but what else would be in a jungle room but a jungle? Let me step back for a moment. Remember Naked Kid? So before she stepped into the office, I tagged her. Not in any sort of physical wiretapping kind of way, but, well, the metaphor fits. I put a tap on her mind that signal. Ever wonder why I call myself the Navigator? Here's why. Finding ins to major corporations on the train is all fine and dandy, but the real meat of the job comes once I need to extract some data. That requires a target and a tag. The tag lets me literally tag along. What she sees, I see. What she hears, I hear. What she smells, well, if I had some sort of olfactory what's it, I'd probably get that too, but smell vision is still not a thing, so whatever, it's not important. So I'm sitting there in the Starbucks across the street with dimmed lenses and big muffly headphones. They become my second eyes, my second ears. She's in the elevator. Morning, Dana, says the voice. Dana? Suddenly I know 100% more about this kid. Experiencing the senses of another human being is a lot like playing a first-person shooter where you've got this overly scripted bullshit at the start of the game, and you're just watching and waiting for the inevitable betrayal or whatever makes your character ultimately decide they're about to shoot dudes in the face. Except, instead of face shooting, you just keep watching that scripted bullshit until something exciting happens. Like turning to face a door and seeing the sign Jungle Room. Look, I won't lie, I'm as weirded out by this room as you probably are, but the real interesting bit, unfortunately, has nothing to do with it. Dana, who I will continue calling Naked Kid, walks right past this unfortunately labeled door and rounds the bend. 
She crosses a cavernous walkway that opens up into glass walls on both sides, looking way down into the fifth floor cafeteria, surrounded by greenery. And then she reaches a new door, one even more conspicuous than the last. It's blank and very locked. At least four sets of locks, in fact, and I count them as she waits for the door to open. She doesn't step back, just waits right there, eyes focused intently on the edge where the door meets frame. Door opens a crack, and suddenly my perspective is smooched up against a surprised face. A familiar face. It's Text Kid. Hey baby, says Naked Kid, backing up a little. Ah, okay. So Naked Kid is Barry, and Text Kid is, um, Yom. Text Kid smiles, brushes fingers against their lips, looking just as cute as they had on the train. They blush. Not at the office, they say. Ah, oh, come on, she replies. You're all alone in there, right? They give her a look. Not for long. You gonna be around tonight? She asks. They give her a pain to look. Work. You've got a bed in there, she says, and I can almost feel her pout. Look, I'll message you when I get a spare moment, alright? She nods. They smooch faces again, together again. Tex Kid shuts the door. Naked Kid heads to her cubicle, footsteps a slow plod compared to the swift pace before. She seems bummed out by her presumed partner's behavior. I'll be honest, so am I. Because Tex Kid's working on something that's secret as shit, and more than anything, I need to know what it is. One last thing she does catches my eye. She sits down at her desk, takes a long, hard stare into nowhere, and down at one of her hands. Sitting pretty on her finger is a ring, but not just any ring, THE silver ring that had resided upon her toe in the mind app. She turns it, slowly, and I'm able to make out the full inscription, Testis Unis, Testis Nullis. One witness is no witness. My only thought as I look through her eyes is, if only you knew. Navigator out. Oof. Cerebral network, mind that. We're being watched. Hey baby, not at the office. Oh, come on, you're all alone in there, right? Not for long. You're gonna be around tonight. Work, you got a bed in there. Look, I'll IM you when I get a spare moment. Alright, stay in there till I give the word. Now, where were we, Rain? Huh. the OC Tavern. Chase, Osmandius, and Barry. Hello, well, that was intense. Chase exhales. I didn't think I could make it through your stupid bet. Barry says, what bet? Manius elucidates, Rain and I bet Chase that he couldn't get through a single RP session without breaking character. Chase says, you have no idea how many lines I had to delete for that. <laughs> uh, laugh. Well, you made it. Gloriously, even. Oz, I'm not even mad about your dumb theatrics. Osmanius elucidates. That wasn't entirely under my control, you know. Stone was there too, and he seemed pretty insistent on getting all antagonistic on us. Chase Holmes, really? I didn't even notice he was around. Creepy. I say, why doesn't Stone ever come out and chat? I've only ever seen him mysteriously appearing in rooms, doing some spoof text, and then leaving. Chase shrugs. That's how stone works. 
He's even more hardcore than you, Rain. No one's heard from him out of character outside of the Muck's login text and admin notes. Hmm. Ozymandias elucidates. He's the administrator, which means he can log in and out, enter and exit rooms, all without displaying any text. It's required of the rest of us to keep our characters in the world at all times, but the admin may as well be role-playing the world itself. He has a log of everything that occurs, regardless of what room it transpires within. Interesting. How do you know all this, Oz? Chase says, Oh, you don't know, do you? Oz used to be admin before Stone. Hmm. Ozymandias nods. A vast majority of the rooms we've been role-playing in are of my creation. Stone took it over when I felt more inclined to play a role than maintain the fiction. Perry says, Whoa, cool, I made the farmhouse, lol. Ozymandias chuckles. I noticed. It has your style about it. I could work with you on elaborating a bit more, perhaps. Its description is fairly limited. Perhaps we could work on it together before we get back into the thick of the plot. Perry glows. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Oz. You say, so... How long has this muck been going? There's never many people on, other than you guys. BT Dubs, I love this song, and it reminds me of, like, a cross between something from Chrono Trigger and Sonic the Hedgehog. Jay says, well, I've been coming here for a good few months or so. Oz would know more, obviously. Osmandius elucidates. The muck had been running for several years when I took over as admin. I'm not certain how long exactly, but it's always been a labor of love. A relic, really. You rarely see anything in text form lately. Roleplaying via text input? Ancient. But to me, it is still the purest form of creativity. Not many get to experience the joy of writing collaboratively in real time. You smile. That's a nice way to put it. Also, I totally agree. Because... Text RP is just amazing. It gives you so much time and chance and opportunity to, like, get into it and work at it. It's nothing award winning, but it's ours. Osmandius elucidates. Precisely. We live in a world where you can get lost in a subconscious fantasy realm populated by the imaginations of millions. Yet the text grounds us in our personal expression, a level of control that one can fully own. Right. That's basically what Jace said. <laughs> Hosmandius chuckles. Barry says, OMG, I just realized something. What's up, Barry? Barry says, why is this called Muck? <laughs> it said in the login screen. I thought you knew. It stands for Multi-User Chat Kingdom. Barry says, I know that's stupid, but Virtus ruled by a queen. <laughs> it should be Queendom. <laughs> Chase laughs. I don't think that's how it works. Osmandius laughs. Well, Muck d doesn't have much of a ring, but I suppose it retains its pronunciation. I'm glad you're well versed in your canon, Barry. I didn't know. Barry smiles. Yeah, I suck at writing, but I know what I'm doing. You shake your head with a laugh. Well, we'll have to talk about the elf thing. I don't doubt you know what you're doing, but it's hard to tell sometimes what with how you type. Perry says, yeah, I've never been good at words. I talk just fine, promise. Never do any RPing with voice chat or in person. Tabletop, role playing, tabletop, role playing, come on. Come on. Say you do it. 
So you play D and D? No. Oh yeah, plenty. It's not as good though. Osmanius chuckles. I agree, but I'm curious why you think that. Perry says, it's just embarrassing. I don't like my voice. Ugh. Yeah, I totally get you on that one, Barry. I feel that. Have you tried using any sort of speech-to-text app? Barry says, what? I never even thought of that. Barry falls asleep. <laughs> and logged out. Well, maybe we'll find out what the fully punctuated and capitalized Barry sounds like soon. Osmania shakes his head. Who knows? She says, Oz, what is their story anyway? Seems like Barry and Jan were always here, but Jan barely says a thing, and Barry is, well, you know. Ozymandias elucidates. Your guess is as good as mine. They've been here even longer than I. Hmm. He's around. He's serious. And they've always been like that. Osmanius nods. There were others, of course. Many others besides the two of them. they what remains, oddly enough, of what I'd refer to as the Old Guard, the generation prior to mine own. What happened to them? Again, I'm not certain. I was admin then, so I never participated in out-of-character talks much. If I had to guess, I'd say that they either got too caught up in work, got married, or otherwise moved on. Oh, that's a damn shame. I can only imagine what this place would feel like full of people. Osmanius chuckles. Not too different from how it is now, really. Even with a fully stocked roster of players, most just idled about in the clearing you spawn in, chatted in here, or made little private rooms to go off and have their own adventures. It must have not always been like that, though, right? All mucks start as a single room and expand out from there. Osmanius nods. We babble before we talk. We walk before we run. Well, yeah, but what does that have to do with this place? Chase waits. <laughs> Must be typing a novel. <laughs> I mean, hey, I'm okay with getting a bunch more detail out of Oz. There he is. Osmanius elucidates. If you think about it, the development of this collection of rooms is a lot like how our minds expand over time. When we're born, we have a finite number of concepts available to us. Our capability to solve problems is binary. We either remain silent and content, or we cry to express whatever misgivings we may have. Eventually, our options grow. We build out our rooms in all directions from that central binary reasoning unit. Instead of heading just west toward expressing contentment or east toward dissatisfaction, our options branch further and further towards the minutiae. We use language to inform our opinions, crude at first, like our dear Barry, and eventually toward the expressive vocabulary available to our chosen language. What we end up with is a construct not just capable of expressing opinions, but able to consider them, debate them. She says, yep, okay, sec, reading. You nod. Okay, you make an eloquent analogy to the physical space of the muck, but what about the players? What are we? Osmanius elucidates. We're the decision makers, the electric synapses within the mind that flow in a certain direction, determining the outcome of its deliberation. Chase smirks. Well, we're sure doing a shit job of it, sitting in here and talking about the nature of the online universe. You grin. Much as I'd like to agree with you, Chase, we should wait for Barry to return before getting back to it. Mm 
<laughs> with how spotty she's been lately. Oh, come on, Jace. Don't be a jerk. Rain is correct. At least, let us wait an hour. If she isn't back by then, we'll presume she's unconscious. Yawn, like her mysterious yawn. Chase grins. Nothing mysterious about a magical coma induced by being dragged across the borders of worlds. Navigator's Log, 6th of June. Wistful Witnesses. I've been putting a lot of thought into the concept of being an observer. Who isn't anymore? We're all witnesses to something, every day, no matter if we like it or not. The entire past apocalypse was built upon the bones of our privacy, picked clean by the vultures that decided to loose the skeletons of a billion closets upon this unsuspe unsuspecting masses. Stripped bare, our world was a fully automated system of appearance recognition and check-ins. Beyond the 20 plus years of its maturation prior to collapse, the internet licked its gaping maw and its hundreds of millions of eyes opened to observe reality and pass judgment. Cameras, phones, webcams built into every computer, all observing the world and providing real-time feedback on its infinite flaws. It was an age of brutal honesty. In what had once been the realm of anonymity, pseudonyms and invented personalities, our skins were shed and left us naked to all that would watch. Most couldn't turn their heads. News outlets across the globe fed bullshit story after clickbait article into the stream, drip-feeding misinformation into our honesty-prone information sockets until we couldn't tell the difference anymore. And the response, of course, was a great undigested congealment that had been rolling about in the acids of the internet's stomach since it bared its shame. The scorned anonymous masses, not even knowing the days of anonymity but sharing in its spirit, unanimously and unconsciously decided that they could not abide. When the phrase, sorry, got hacked, became just as common as had cereal for breakfast, well shit, something's going on. When your entire online culture is constructed out of a series of assumed truths, with people behaving completely unlike themselves without disrupting the stream of their reality, yeah, that's a tremor. When faceless mind slugs are crawling into the skins of established personae and directing the course of their observed lives, that is a bomb stuffed with the finest powder of trust, ready to be blown to shit when it affects the most visible people in the world. No one could be trusted. Faces were as good as pieces of paper washed away in the downpour. Everything that was built up over those countless years, gone, reduced to a collection of fuzzy signals from smashed cameras. Consider where those actions led. Consider what we have now. How is it so different? How is it not worse? We are now observers of a reality that cannot be altered, hidden, or defriended, as seen through the very eyes of its participants. The concept of a collective sub-reality that lies just beneath the surface is an enticing one. It's one that's been written about in fiction for years. What is more secure than your mind, your own thoughts? What better proof is there to your own identity than the fact that you exist and your memories are the same as they were yesterday? But are they? If you had another person's memories, could you tell the difference? Or are you actually, in fact, now that person? Friends, even with my large biases, I'll admit that yes, we are more secure today than we were yesterday. The subtleties of the mind are a far greater security mechanism than an alphanumeric code. Yet never, not for one moment, think that we are better off. Depressed yet? Good. It's time to lighten the mood with the further adventures of yours truly. Neither Text Kid nor Naked Kid were on the train this morning. I figure they took a sick day to abscond together or whatever. With both of their absences, it's almost back to business as usual. Except today, I'm sitting on that train, ignoring the flashy mind that, thinking to myself, why not go for a change in scenery? So I do. I get off the train at whatever stop and navigate to the nearest park. People like a good park. Seems like everyone does today, because as soon as I arrive, I notice way more activity than my usual train going. There's a couple guys walking their dogs, sending mind dats full of shit in plastic bags. There are some joggers in sweats that absolutely do not need any help projecting their self-image. There are a couple of kids, literal ones, on the swings, thankfully not equipped with frames. But there's one kid, figurative, 
who was staring at them from a bench across the way. Guy's dripping in full-on creeper vibe, but his mind that's curious. Oh my, first reaction to seeing a mid-40s guy staring at children is stay the fuck away from that mind. But if I'm gonna dip a toe into the pool, I've gotta check all the ripples. Turns out he doesn't have kids on the brain at all. I tap in, and at once I feel the rush, the exhilaration. He's flying. There's nothing that excites me more than a flyer. Flying is the purest form of data transfer. It's slow as hell, but the adrenaline rush you get is second only to sex. Not many kids are flyers. Not many realize they are. We spend all our subconscious on mind data transfer, so the pleasure of a flying dream is just wasted. It's hard to catch since, due to the slow transfer speed, their LEDs aren't all that seductive. But here this kid is, wings spread. He's got literal wings sprouting from his back, soaring above the city. I just close my eyes and bask in it, almost forgetting why I'm there. But the next image from his transfer makes me stop dead in my tracks. He shifted perspectives, focusing directly on the literal kids. They kick off, leap, and transform. A bead of sweat melts down his jaw. The next image comes rapid fire. The kids have fully transformed into doves, flapping out of the park and into the sky. The flyer, his hands and feet transformed into razor-sharp talons, skewer the doves straight through their snowy chests. Fuck this guy. I stand, flipping between my green-tinted vision and further updates on the pervert's sick mind that stream. The fuck is he thinking, I wonder, trying to pace myself in light of a more and more panicked desperation. Check the direction. The data isn't going far. Does he have an accomplice? A client? Who the fuck would want two girls dead? Is he just a psychopath, live-vlogging his sick escapades? All of a sudden, I get this itch at the back of my mind. It says to me, why do you care? You're not some fucking hero. You break the law. You profit off people's private information. But what would you have done? If you saw a note in the street that said, I would like to kill these children, wouldn't you do whatever it took to stop it? Unless you're a coward. Unless you're me. I was feeling stupid today. There was a stupid fire raging because I spent the whole day thinking about how we got into this mess, thinking, man, fucking Carl Jung got it all wrong. The only collective unconscious we've got is our inability to be decent fucking human beings. Kid stands up. He walks off, out of the park. Of course I tag him. Sun's already starting to set, so I jog to catch up. He looks up at a street sign. I see it. I'm there. He rounds the corner and runs straight into me. My fists bunched up, dress billowing all dramatic, and plenty of that stupid fire burning behind goggled eyes. He just stands there, dumbfounded, until I speak up. The fuck are you doing? Huh, he says, and I, watch a, I want to punch his hying face in. Those kids. Don't know what you're talking about. Saw you staring something fierce, man. You crazy, he blurts out. Think I'm some kind of perv? Pete's me, I say. You're the one staring at kids. I see his mind that send off an image the moment it reaches wireless. One punch straight to my jaw. But I beat him to it. Kick him right in the groin. I turn tail, dash off, and I'm down the street. Except his message got through. Some massive shadow emerges from the blurry peripheral of my escape. A punch to the gut sends my vision reeling into the black, far faster than the pain reaches my noggin. I feel it, and more, when I wake up. Smells like shit. Turns out I'm in a dumpster. A dumpster with something heavy as hell keeping it shut. A couple bangs to the lid later and the exhaustion kicks in. Weird as it seems, I'm thankful in that moment. Thankful that I'm still alive. Hoping those kids are too. But most of all, I'm thankful for wireless because, well, how else would I get this log out to you all? When I get out of here, I'm taking all of the showers. Forever. Navigator out. P.S. If you see a dumpster with, like, rocks or some shit on it, can you please get me out? Hearts. So, that was definitely some intense shit going on there. So, what have we learned? We learned that text kid and naked kid are both 
two of the characters we know from the monk. Uh, what's their face? Um, Yon. Yon and Barry. Still no clue who Oz or the rest are. And then, of course, we've got the navigator who stood up to some guy who was going to murder some kids or something and then promptly got trapped in a dumpster. But I'm proud of her that she stood up to them, because I mean, bystander syndrome and all that, it's not easy to act when you see bad stuff happening. Well, anywho, thanks so much for watching everybody. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to like, subscribe, um, maybe leave a comment down below, or check in the doobly-doo for my Twitter, my Tumblr, my Patreon, and my PayPal. You know, if you can send a message my way, or send some money my way, or whatever. Alright, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Bye!